for another conference. And ever since I've been trying to get him here, so finally this has happened. So it's really, really, uh, uh, you know, a great time. Uh, great that he could make it here. So just a brief introduction to Doug. Doug leads all of design, development, manufacturing, IT, and procurement for Patagonia. He also oversees advanced innovation, as well as social and environmental responsibility, and he's held the position of Chief Operating Officer since April of 2013. From 2007 to 2013, Doug was the Vice President of Global Supply Chain, where he was responsible for the delivery of quality products shipped on time to Patagonia customers. During this period, Doug initiated and managed strategies that consolidated the company's factory base, improved product quality, and redesigned the supply chain processes and systems. Doug joined Patagonia in 1985 upon graduating with a BA in English from UC Berkeley. He just told me that when he was graduating from his high school, he did also apply to Michigan, uh, <clears throat> but chose to go to Berkeley. Uh, in 1994, he left the company for 10 years. Uh, he wanted to see a life outside of Patagonia. Uh, and outside of California, and he held director level positions with Polo, North Face, and Sport Obermeyer, uh, but eventually returned back to Patagonia. So uh, it's really, as I said, great pleasure. He's, he came last uh, evening, and uh, I've, I met him. We had great discussions, and he met with a large group of students today. Uh, so really, we have made him work very hard for his visit here, uh, but he assures me that he has enjoyed every bit of it. Uh, so without further ado, Doug, uh, floor is yours, really delighted uh, to have you here. Uh, Doug is going to spend about maybe 25 minutes or half an hour just uh, presenting the Patagonia uh, perspective, and then we'll open the floor for question and answer. So uh, there are a few hand mics here, and we have volunteers who will run around. So if you have questions, just raise your hand, and uh, we'll get the discussion going. Uh, Doug, floor is yours. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. It's, it's been a real pleasure to be here today. I found my day uh, uh, really interesting. Really couldn't be more impressed with the program that you're all in. And uh, I just think it's uh, been a fantastic time. So I want to walk you through uh, Patagonia and give you a, a real uh, flavor for you know, our mission, our product, um, the values that drive us, and the challenges we, that we face. And as Ravi said, I really welcome uh, any and all questions uh, that you may have. I, I told several groups that I met with today that uh, last spring I was asked to do a, a Reddit AMA, which I had no idea at the time what it was, um, but plenty of warnings after I agreed to do it, uh, what the pitfalls were. Uh, and it wound up being fine, um, but I really like the freewheeling aspect of the AMA. So, so any and all questions are, are definitely welcome. Um, you know, I think the first thing I would tell anyone about Patagonia is that uh, every one of us, almost to a man um, in Ventura and throughout the company's ranks around the world, feel that the Earth is in near env environmental crisis. You know, we see it in our day-to-day. -day. Uh, we see it in the places that we recreate. Um, we've, we've talked uh, earlier today about Chamonix. If, if you go to Chamonix to, to climb ice or to do the Haute Route, the guidebooks that you would use are, are almost out of date now because the ice and the glaciers have receded so far. So many of our customers are without a place to use our product or find it, finding it more and more challenging. In New York City, um, over the Thanksgiving holiday, our, our sales have, have reduced by some 30%. Why? It's unseasonably warm out there. Um, you know, I come from California, where we've been in a tremendous four-year drought. And whether you link all those things up to climate change or or global warming or what have you. I think it's unmistakable what's going on. We think um, that everything that we do at the company pollutes and that we're part of the problem on some level. And so we take it um, really seriously to build product um, the, in the best way that we can, the best product that's going to be used year after year, decade after decade. 
that's kept out of landfill. It's really important. Um, doing it in a way with the supply chain and with the materials that we choose um, to cause no unnecessary harm, either socially or envir environmentally. And to use the company as a way to uh, you know, facilitate and inspire crisis, uh, uh, solutions to this environmental crisis. So, you know, our, <laughs> it's good not to get the mission statement wrong, but I managed to get, get in the way of that. So, we started in 1957, this is our founder, Yvonne Chouinard, um, pounding out pitons in uh, an area of the company that still exists called the Tin Shed. And, um, you know, Yvonne at that time was uh, a former falconer and uh, got into rock climbing down in Chatsworth, which is um, uh, out in the San Fernando Valley of Los Angeles. And he started making climbing tools in, in Ventura because he, one, he could surf the point breaks um, up in Ventura and Santa Barbara, and then in the spring and fall, take his pitons and climbing gear on the road in his van up to Yosemite, out to the Tetons, and sell it out of his van. And he re, you know, repeated this cycle for years and years. And this is his ragtag crew. Um, his partner on the left, Tom Frost, um, helped him. He was an uh, engineering student and helped you know, YC blueprint, a lot of the designs, and he wound up perfecting a lot of the climbing tools that were out there. Um, pitons, carabiners, um, ice axes. You know, if you have ever swung an ice axe, uh, you'll notice that the ads, as they call it, is curved, and that, that roughly follows the same motion that you would use to, you know, put your, your axe into the ice. That curve gives us the ability to dig in a little further. Back then, Scottish ice axes all had a straight ads. And Yvonne figured out that you know, this innovation of the, the curve really helped climbers solve a problem. You know, better, grippier, more sturdy uh, grip on the ice for ice climbers. And this innovation um, led you know, YC, as we call him, to his first realization that the tools he was building for mountaineers were, were having harm on the rock surface that they were designed to be used on. So, you pound pitons into rock cracks, um, you're breaking apart the rock. In the wintertime, the snow and the ice get in there, it freezes and it expands. And so it breaks open the rock further. And he'd get to the valley, Yosemite Valley, and he'd see that you know, crack systems on El Cap and elsewhere were littered with these holes. And he could see his routes marked by these pock marks on the rock, and it was a realization that everything that he was doing at that time was having an irreversible effect you know, on routes that he really loved. And so that was a, a seminal moment, and he got to thinking, and he, like the ice axe example, he started experimenting with other tools, chocks, hexes, things that fit into cracks. If you notice his rack here, these, these things that are shaped kind of as nuts are called chocks. You can put them in a crack, they come out real easily. Pitons, sometimes you have to leave them in there. And they work just as well, they easily are cleaned out from uh, crack systems. And he decided to sell, his, uh, to uh, drop his best selling product, the piton. Completely drop it. And took the time to educate his customers in the whole natural art of protect protection, you know, protecting a climb. How do you do that in, a, in the most responsible way possible? And it, a, a, again, it was a real game changer for, for him. His climbing business at that time was smaller than it is now, which is really darn small. Um, but, you know, a big moment for him. And, and, you know, in the early 70s, he started to import rugby shirts. Rugby shirts from, from Scotland, authentic um, rugby shirts that you could repel in that were tough enough from an abrasion standpoint to you know, withstand rock surfaces. Double seated shorts and pants that, again, very abrasion resistant. And that was really the start of Patagonia. Um, you know, the company was developed under this own brand of Patagonia. Chenard equipment you know, continued on and we started to get into other products like Pile. Uh, this tan pile, if, if you guys are, if some of you are long-term fans of the company, you remember this is one of the first pile jackets that we made, that, that label very, uh, at least those of us in Ventura, very iconic. 
and that gave way to bunting. Bunting was an innovation beyond pile because it didn't pill as much. And that gave way to cinchilla because cinchilla pilled even less than bunting. So this continuous improvement in product, finding materials that are innovations that are, are better than their predecessor, um, you know, that developed into all sorts of things. And today, you know, we are nearly a $700 million company. We expect to be well into the 700s at the end of this fiscal year in April. Um, we sell in a, a very narrow select distribution of, of premium wholesale um, accounts, accounts like the Bivouac here in Ann Arbor. We operate 100 retail stores of our own name throughout the world, 30 here in, in, in uh, this country. And our website really has a very synergistic impact on the whole uh, distribution channel. So we're really truly an omni-channel brand, you know, selling in roughly equal thirds in wholesale retail and, and e-com. We have 2,200 people globally, 525 out in Ventura now, and, uh, you know, with nearly 700 million in sales, we give 1% of that away each year through our membership and 1% for the planet. 1% for the planet is a, a, a network of companies that have pledged 1% of their revenue uh, to grassroots environmental organizations, and we're very, very proud of that. One of the reasons we can do that is that we're still privately owned. So we're among the few companies of, of our size um, held you know, privately. Uh, the Chenard still own it. YC is uh, very active. Uh, as is his wife, Melinda, and their kids, uh, Fletcher and Claire, on our board of directors. And uh, it really maintains all of the you know, foundational values that we have. Building the best product, as you saw from the opening uh, mission statement, is, is really our call to arms. We're, at our heart, at our core, a product-driven company. It's not about marketing. It's not about... Um, sales, it's, it's not about the financial aspects, it's about building the best product. We want to hold ourselves up to that standard every time. And, you know, the people that, that, that buy our product are um, either they're climbers like this fellow or they aspire to, to be ice climbers and alpinists and rock climbers. We're still located in Ventura, and we've got some great surfing out there. This is one of the boards that Yvonne's son, uh, Fletcher, is designing, or the Fletcher Chenard uh, Designs logo. Um, we're building our own wetsuits. We're building board shorts. Um, backcountry skiers, fly fishermen, all gravitate around the Patagonia brand because we're known for our functionality, timeless design, hopefully products they can keep using year after year, decade after decade. Some of our best products include the Snap Tea. When I started at the company in 1985, this was one of our best-selling products back then, 20, 30 million in sales at the time. It's still in the line today. Um, and it's, it's, you know, that timelessness is something that we really strive to, to hit in, in each of our designs. The Houdini Pullover. Uh, you can stuff this thing uh, into a, a wad the size of your fist and put it in your, your front pocket. And it, at the same time, has great wind, great you know, water repellency, is very breathable. You can take it on a, on a run. You can fish in it. You can uh, hike, climb. Its, it's versatility is unmatched. The R1 hoodie, you know, different fabric at the waist, cut for a climbing harness, thumb loops, so you're, you know, when you're swinging your ice axe, it, your cuff doesn't fall down your, your wrist. Uh, angled zippers so you can get your hand in there easy. They don't chafe your chin. Uh, the DOS parka, you know, if you're suffering from the polar vortex in Ann Arbor, you want a DOS, DOS parka. It's warm. So, you know, ice climbers, you know, are sitting there very stationary. It's good stuff to have. And finally, the Wayfair board short, you know, our surf division is, is very successful. We're going to uh, eclipse 50 million here with just surf wetsuits, board shorts, um, the surfboard division, very excited about that. The social and environmental responsibility of, of it all is, is one of the challenges. You know, it's, it's very difficult to get your arms around a, a supply chain, um, you know, this vast, and we're 700 million in sales, you know. If you look at Nike at 30 billion, you kind of quickly see, 
you know, the challenges that both Nike and companies in between have. Um, in our case, we work with 45 suppliers who operate 86 different factories, 16 countries, um, raw material suppliers, 250 strong in 22 countries, and a tier three supply chain of farms for all the natural um, fiber products that we sell, organic cotton, hemp, uh, wool, merino wool. Um, in this picture to the right, uh, the goose down, the duck down supply chain. So the farms, the most difficult uh, things to really understand and really audit thoroughly and really, you know, contain the risk of. Um, the tier two, the next toughest. You know, we've, we've just scratched the surface and we're auditing an amount of suppliers that represents 80% of the business volume that we do. But still, we're leaving a lot uncovered. So it's, it's all about placing our resources on the hot spots of the supply chain, knowing where, where to look. And, and it's like skiing. You know, you fall down a lot and you get humbled and you get, you get poked and, and uh, you take some heat. But it's always something that we have our eye on and, and something that we're constantly questioning how we're allocating those resources. We map our supply chain in as robust a way we can. And not only that, but we put it on the website for everybody to see. So if you go to other apparel manufacturers, you might see a very flat Excel file of supplier names and addresses that doesn't speak to you at all. Um, it's not that it's a bad thing to have it out there. It's a very transparent thing. But the way we want to do it is to show people what we think, what the bad aspects are of each product that we make in the supply chain that we manage, what, what things that are good. Um, outside of this example, we talk a lot about on the Footprint Chronicles, um, PFOCs, fluorocarbon-based durable water repellent finishes on the outside of most outerwear. So your down sweater has a durable water repellent finish and that's harmful to the environment. And to, you know, you find traces of it in our bodies itself. You find traces in the, in the natural environment. We're working like demons to come up with a bio-based durable water repellent. And that's the kind of discourse that we talk about on the Footprint Chronicle site in an effort to be completely transparent. One of the distinguishing features and one of the things we're most proud of is, is what we call the fourfold approach to supplier certification and sourcing. And, you know, usually, and we talked a lot about this today in the, the sessions that I had with uh, the MBA students here, um, you know, if, if you depend on the sourcing people to choose which fact factories you're going to use, you usually get pretty good prices, good delivery, capacity that you need, you know, and competitive minimum order quantities. But you don't reflect the values of the company, you know, in that supply chain. You know, values for quality product. If that isn't represented in the decision-making process, you, you generally wind up with prices that are great, factories that can offer low prices, but not build to the Patagonia standard of wanting to keep product out of the landfill. Product so durable it stays out of there. Social and environmental responsibility are the same. So you have these four constituencies collaborating on decisions, and you get a supply chain that reflects the company's values for all four of these areas. And I think that we've kept problems to a minimum using this approach. Um, I would like to thank all the people manufacturing in the Patagonia supply chain are as happy as she is, but the realities are that they're not. And you have to accept the fact that the profit motive of the supplier is going to mean that they're going to cut corners. And so we rely on auditors, our own auditors to get into the factory, our own people to get into those factories, designers, developers, material innovations people, quality auditors, social and environmental responsibility auditors. All five or six of those, peop those groups are touching the factory at any one time. We train them all as to what to look for when they're in a supplier. And we use third-party auditors to come unannounced to look and see what they find. 
We have a, a, a critical non-compliance list in our, non, in our uh, code of conduct that allows us to identify problems as we see them, and we work with our supply chain to remediate them. We don't like to leave suppliers. We like long-term relationships, and we don't like new suppliers very much either. It's an exclusive club like Michigan and Ross to get admitted into our supply chain. Cause no unnecessary harm. Our founder, Yvonne, you know, to, to actually do good, you have to do something. You know, this is a look that we often get in board meetings. You know, it's, it's like, come on here. What are you guys actually doing, excuse me, to, um, you know, reflect, you know, our values in every decision that you're making? Now, Yvonne made it hard on us because he wrote a book called Let My People Go Surfing. So you have a whole bunch of employees thinking it surfs up. And it's hard to get a lot of work done there. But we, we tell them that, you know, among our guiding pr principles is leading and examine life. Looking, you know, at what we're doing, just like in the Footprint Chronicles, and asking ourselves, you know, what's good about this? What's bad about this product? How is it polluting? How is it impacting the environment or people in the supply chain? Cleaning up our own act, um, you know, recycling product, doing things like the Footprint Chronicles, doing our penance, giving 1% of our revenue away each and every year, no matter how profitable we are, supporting civil democracy. At Patagonia, um, if you're out picketing something or, or you're out in a protest march and you get thrown in jail, we'll bail you out. That's a great perk. <laughs> And influencing other companies. We, we want to, you know, we want to create an atmosphere and, a, and a, an environment that other companies want to emulate because they see that if we can be successful, um, you know, giving 1% of our, our profits away but still doing 9% net income and hopefully a little longer in the years ahead, that they'll want to follow that example. So if we're, you know, out at places like this talking about what we're doing and, and hopefully inspiring other companies to follow us, or in the, the companies that you work for eventually, if you've started to do some of these things, that's an example of how we might extend our influence. You know, when Yvonne looks, to, you know, looks at us and says, you know, you gotta, you gotta clean up your act, he, you know, he's really looking at situations like conventionally grown cotton. You know, in the, in the mid-90s, we found and we commissioned a study to look at conventionally grown cotton and what impact that has on both the environment and on people. You know, conventionally grown cotton is finished in the dye and finish phase with a lot of formaldehyde. We don't want formaldehyde on us. We don't want to be, you know, killing the earth that that cotton is planted in by using all of the pesticides that conventional cotton uses. You know, Textiles and apparel is the second most polluting industry there is. And so we made a decision back then to move entirely to organic cotton. Now, today, and we, we talked about this a little bit earlier, um, organic cotton represents 1.5% of all cotton sold. It's a, it's a, it's a program that, while um, we're very proud of it, it didn't scale, right? It didn't meet widespread acceptance within the apparel industry. We continue to use 100% organic cotton in every fabric that we produce. We don't stomp on it and blend it and things like that, but we go 100% and that's a good thing. But again, it's not something that's scaled. Now, post-consumer recycled fleece is something that's been more successful. This is something we started with Malden Mills back in the mid-90s. And, you know, Basically, it was a, 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 it was a fleece product that was 30% more than conventional fleece. And we were out on the margins. We had to raise prices of the snap tee that you saw earlier because we were buying more expensive fabric. Why? Because it was recycled content. And we didn't want to use non-recycled content in our product. We want to kind of get off being so extractive and do more with what we have. So today, the U.S. military, when they buy um, fleece or polyester product from United Knitting or Polar Tech, they insist on recycled content throughout their, their line. And those guys are big customers, and that's 
an example of um, PCR fleece scaling. 90% of Polartec line today is made from recycled content. Um, we are able to recycle every product that we make, and we put recycling bins in every store that we have, in every office that we maintain around the world. We send it back to a mill, and they chop it up and turn it into polyester chip and you know, spin it back into yarn, and we make more you know, polyester or nylon um, fabric and then products from it. It's a pretty small percent. It's not as big as we'd like. We'll talk a little bit more about repairs um, and we go a little further there. But this commitment to transparency that you saw in the Footprint Chronicles that we looked at a bit earlier, uh, you know, if you have a chance, I wish I had the video link here, but if you have a chance to go on YouTube and put in the traceable, uh, traceable down from Patagonia, you'll see this um, cartoon that, that has the effect of, of educating people as to conventional down and why conventionally raised geese and ducks are force fed and live plucked. Those are two practices that we don't want to have in our supply chain. And so we recently went to a lot of effort to put an animal welfare practice into place with our geese and duck farms. Uh, on the duck side, much of that comes from Michigan and Indiana, I would add, from uh, a, a great network of suppliers. And that down is called traceable down, and it's ensured to be uh, you know, non-life plucked and non-force fed. NSF here of Ann Arbor helps certify that, and we're really, really proud of that effort. Um, we recently were uh, interviewed by The Atlantic um, online about what we found in Taiwan in the raw material, uh, raw material tier two supply chain. And, you know, there, a lot of the employees, a lot of the people of those textile mills are saddled up with a broker fee to get their jobs. And it takes them three to five years to work it off. We we're horrified when we found that. We were really at loose ends to understand, you know, how to fix that problem. So we worked with Verite, uh, you know, an NGO, and auditing firm. We rounded up all the Taiwanese suppliers. We brought them to a hotel conference room in Taipei City, and we talked about what we found and what we wanted the future state to look like. We asked that supply chain to pay all the employees back for their broker fees. We wanted those people made whole, and we wanted them to follow uh, a toolbox effort that we worked with Verite on to audit for broker fees, to audit for you know, held passports, to audit for held bank books, other forms of human trafficking that need to come out of the supply chain. You know, and, and like uh, Yvonne was horrified with the pitons and what they did, we were really horrified by this. And uh, there are other things that, that uh, concern us as well. But we try to respond as responsibly as we can, and, and we do so because we want the company to inspire solutions to the environmental crisis. It's really critical to us. Um, you know, these folks are particularly inspired and are working on saving the Colorado River, um, which nowadays doesn't even flow down to the Gulf of Baja um, because Arizona and California is using much of the river and much of the water coming out of it. Um, it's, a, it's a real issue, but this is where our 1% for the planet money goes to grassroots activists like these folks uh, who are a little questionable. Um, <laughs> But we bring them to what we call the Tools Conference. And the Tools Conference is something that we hold um, at the Stanford Sierra Camp um, up near Lake Tahoe. And we bring in both people from Patagonia and outside um, experts to train our, our environmental groups that we've given money to on things like tabling causes, managing their money, accounting, uh, PR, um, all manner of different tools that they can then use to manage the money that Patagonia and other, co other uh, uh, companies are giving them to use that money better. And it's a very inspiring event. Damnation was a film uh, that we produced, and it's about uh, what we call deadbeat dams, dams that don't serve any functional purpose any longer. They don't generate much electricity, much energy. Uh, what they do do is keep sediment from flowing downriver. They 
you know, which destroys the ecosystem. They keep salmon from, you know, flowing up the river and spawning up the river. And it's a, it's a real problem. Um, we're, we're, we think we're going to be successful with a dam on, actually, on the Stanford campus. Um, and we think we're going to be able to convince them to tear it down. We've been somewhat successful so far. There's another on the Snake River that's really impactful. But this was a movie that we funded to bring attention to this. Um, Vote the Environment, Jumbo Wild, another uh, film. Vote the Environment being you know, the campaign that we put out each election year to get people thinking about who they're going to vote for, which candidates reflect our envir environmental values. Jumbo Wild, a development up in British Columbia for a ski area. You would think we'd be for that, uh, but we have a lot of backcountry skiers that like to ski up there, and they don't need chairlifts, and we don't need more development up there, and it's going to destroy where that bear likes to walk around. Defined, defined by the line, uh, the fight to protect the bear's ears. We got that um, Secretary Jewell. She was formerly the um, uh, REI CEO, and now she's the Secretary of Interior. They are going to make the Bears Ears region a national monument. Now, that was very successful. We, we helped bring more awareness to that. And Mile for Mile is a small, you know, just short film about our work to create a national park in the Patagonia region. Disruptive. Disruptive business, you know, we want to kind of stand for that, you know, like we bail people out of jail and we do all these kind of West Coast things. <laughs> we want to be known as disruptors. Um, you know, we've talked today in, in some of the classes about don't, you know, the don't buy this jacket campaign that we did in 2010. And, um, you know, a colleague of mine went out to Harvard Business School and talked about this and this idea to do it. And they just, they, they thought we were out of our minds, and they couldn't figure out the sense of it at all, um, and that there had to be some hidden motive behind doing something like this. Well, what this did, and, you know, iterations of it today do, is, is get people thinking about their buying practices, that, you know, thinking about the product that you want to buy, um, and whether you really need it, whether you have something that you can continue to use. Um, you know, reducing your consumption, re repairing what, you know, if you have a zipper on a pack that's broken, um, if you're not using it, give, gifting it to a family member or a friend, and then at the end of its useful life, having a go at recycling that product. Um, you know, you saw the big pile of, you know, bailed up garments. How many brands can run an ad like this? Well, not very many public companies are going to try it. But we think this is a way to be disruptive and get people thinking about it. We don't much care if it you know, subverts sales, as long as we bring more people under the tent to get them thinking about what this means and do they resonate with those kinds of values. A rehash of the Common Threads pledge. Um, we took a lot of email names and, and uh, got a lot of attention for this. I think we should go f further and incent you know, customers to sign up for the Common Threads uh, pledge, um, you know, and give them a discount or, or free shipping or what have you. Um, you know, more worn wear here. Um, we send a van around, this funky van that, that could only have been built in California, uh, goes around mountain towns and, and college campuses. I'm not sure if it's been here to Ann Arbor or not, um, but we have a little repair center and a seamstress from the Reno Distribution Center, and they fix, fix products. So if your down sweater zipper breaks, we're going to fix it in the van. And that reflects a much bigger effort up in Reno, where we hire 59 people to do nothing but repair old Patagonia product, which is kind of nuts, because it costs us $2 million a year to do this. So it turns out 40,000 units a year. I uh, mean, do the math. Uh, my English major math skills says that's 50 bucks a unit. That's a lot of money, and we seldom charge back for those repairs. So if you, if you want to send something in and have you know, your ski pants shortened, we'll do that, and we'll charge for that. But that is uh, a fraction of what we're getting back. It's mostly zipper repairs. It's some people you know, tear their jackets, ski in the trees, um, and we do that, uh, that work free. 
Um, 1% for the Planet, the Fair Labor Association, the, the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, which we helped found, Blue Sign, this industry textile standard that helps you know, ban uh, RSLs, restricted substances from the dyeing and finishing of our fabrics, the, Con the Conservation Alliance that really opens up access to the outdoors, um, all examples of hopefully being disruptive. Um, Patagonia Provisions is another great example uh, where we're, um, you know, developing a line of, of packable, um, sustainable, responsibly produced food that you can take into the backcountry. Um, you know, salmon shown here, salmon jerky, buffalo jerky, sampa soup, um, sampa being a multi-grain that's very high in its caloric content. Um, we're expanding that into some hot cereals. Uh, we did a run of 10,000 cases of uh, beer with uh, New Belgium Brewery. Uh, that was pretty cool. Um, um, but provisions just eclipsed $1 million in sales this year. And we have something to say, you know, in the food industry. You know, how food is done. If you're um, a fan of, of Michael Pollan and the Omnivore's Dilemma or Fast Food Nation, uh, Patagonia Provisions is right up your alley. Excuse me. Um, we're, we were the first registered B Corporation in the state of California. Yvonne was up there at the state capitol signing up the first chance he had on, I think it was January 3rd. And, uh, you know, the company, again, wholly owned by the Schnard family, but you, you don't know how things change. We're not for sale, right? But all things change. And no matter what happens, though, what we do in product, um, what we do with 1% for the planet, um, with we, what we do with, um, you know, provisions and, and giving money away, and, and, you know, the charter of the company will always remain the same given our benefit corporation status. And we're quite proud of that. And that brings me to the end of the presentation, um, but I'd like to take any and all questions you might have. So if you have a question, please raise your hand, and then uh, we'll have the uh, helpers with the mic. Uh, okay, I'm here. Um, thank you so much for being here. I, I wanted to ask a question about the piece of the mission the, about building the best product. Um, obviously, the best product is a moving target. Um, and so I was wondering if you could speak to a little bit of the innovation process that happens at Patagonia to build the best product, both with performance as well as sort of the environmental and social uh, responsibility aspects. We. Um Three seasons ago, so by the fall 15 season, we committed to doing something called the Design Quality uh, Rating Index. And so we have a designer, a quality engineer, um, a business unit manager, and a product developer um, rate the product against 10 criteria, and we quantify that, and we weight it, and we do it on a 1 to 10 scale. And the product rating system, it's in our B Corp charter to rate every single product that we make. Anything under an eight gets dropped. And so it's, it's you know, among the criteria are timeless design. You know, does it fit? Is it multifunctional? So the Houdini that you, rem you might remember, um, you know, you can use that for any number of the sports that we produce product for. It's, it, it's in our packs every time we go out. Um, scores very highly on multifunction. Um, is it made from sustainable, responsible materials. Is it fair trade? You know, is, is that one of the factories in our fair trade you know, program? And so that's the first step, really, um, that we've taken to, to quantify it on a, what, what amounts to a very simple you know, level. What is next is to really dig into the LCAs behind recycled polyester, behind um, recycled nylon, that helps us understand how um, you know, synthetic replications of spider silk, which is something that we're working on with a, a great company out in Emeryville, California, how, how those choices impact on what's the most responsible way we can proceed. 
they're really expensive studies. Uh, there's, a, there, you know, there's a lot going on there. But that's going to be, along with the Higg index, which is coming in 2020, it's a, long, a little long way off for our taste. That will give us a more uh, you know, quantitative way to evaluate things. Hi, thanks again for being here. I think we're here in the middle. Uh, we all really appreciate your being here. It's a, it's a special opportunity for us. So my question is about, you mentioned quite an array of sustainability challenges that you're looking at. And I'm curious what you would describe as sort of, since there are so many, what are your top three that you really think are opportunities for big wins for Patagonia? And what are you, what are you doing to make progress on those? Um, I think that uh, stepping up the percentage of recycled or reclaimed uh, materials that we use is a huge opportunity. Backing off on the water energy, um, the water and energy used on those materials is a huge opportunity. And moving more toward a living wage across the entire supply chain is, you know, enormous. You know, we have a third of our product built in fair trade certified factories. We think we're making some decent progress there. We're going to adopt a, a, uh, an FLA, Fair Labor Association, standard for responsible wages. Um, there's a lot going on there. But on water-free dyeing, you know, we, we talked earlier in one of the classes about the apparel industry, the global apparel industry using as much water as exists in the Mediterranean Ocean. Um, you know, in the drought in California, you saw the Colorado River, um, water, topsoil, all of that is going to be very hard to find, very hard to come by. So we're working very closely with the university in Hong Kong to develop water-free dyeing. Um, it occurs to me that if any of you go to our competitors, uh, all our trade secrets are, are done. But, you know, bio-based DWRs, we mentioned that, bio-based wrinkle-free finishes, um, antimicrobials and base layer, which are key, you know, polyester. The one thing that wool has over polyester, it doesn't smell. Um, polyester base layer is notorious for that. So those are the top three things I'd say. Hi. Can I? Can you just okay. pass the mic to? Where's the mic? Hi. Uh, I just want to echo what my peers said about how much of an honor it is for you to be here. Um, I was curious if you could expand on your one percent for the pro for the plan initiative and just talk about um, like what kind of things you've been involved with in the past with that and what your criteria is for choosing what you do. Hmm. I think the the funnest and most rewarding thing um, that I personally was involved in um, and continue to be involved in is, um, you know, e each of the VPs and, you know, managers has $10,000 to give to, you know, their department and those employees choose where the money goes. Our environmental grants program chooses on the entire um, spectrum of where that money goes. Um, the Environmental Grants Program, uh, those people serve on the Grants Council for 18 months at a time. They meet quarterly. They review all the prospectuses um, sent by people needing money to fund their environmental cause. And uh, it's, it's among the most rewarding work that takes place at Patagonia. Um, it, it really is something. And we talked earlier about, you know, what really gets us you know, motivated and inspired. And, you know, if, if we're fortunate to break, you know, whatever number we do sales wise, if it's 770 or 800 million, um, you know, we're going to give either 7.7 .7 million or 8 million away this year to grassroots environmental causes. And that's profound. That's something we really get stoked by. There's a question there, yeah, and then we'll come, then we'll come to you. you okay. Hello. Um, my, my question is, how does Patagonia make a choice or a decision when environmental and economic outcomes are at odds with each other? You know, we face that tension all the time. Um, I, you know, you could rattle off a number of examples just, just sitting here. Years back, um, we had a, a surefire way of imparting um, antimicrobial finishes to base layer. 
Again, base layer is a stinky product. You, you run in it once and you're done. Um, run in it twice and no one wants to sit by you. <laughs> and we had a way through one of our textile mills to put an a, a antimicrobial that was silver-based, in other words, silver, the mineral-based, and it worked every time, it never washed out, but we didn't do it, even though it would have led to the best product because it had this tremendous extractive environmental toll. Uh, PVC, um, often in, our, uh, in the boots that we manufacture for fly fishermen, PVC is among the tougher, sturdier materials that we could use. Um, you know, we were kind of caught in this quandary of do we use PVC or do we use something, you know, different that could wear out faster. And so we're always trying to weigh the, the balance. The design quality rating system can help kind of find our way out of that hole. But the, one, of the, one of the most wonderful things at, at Patagonia that I never found without uh, put, you know, uh, I don't want to be critical of my former employers, but we don't have the pressure of price you know, to deal with. When we're building best product, we don't have to worry about detuning or using less expensive materials or going to a C-level factory that pays, you know, eight cents a minute instead of the, the 12 that we might expect in a better factory. So we're not confined by, by price or price, price pressure. So we try to m make that determination by what ultimately is going to build the best product. All right, hi. Um, so I have a more of a philosophical question. How would you respond to someone that holds um, similar views as like Milton Freeman, who thinks that you know for-profit organizations should don't shouldn't have any interest in social initiatives or social interest? Um, and I know that Patagonia is a private company, but I know that other B Corps like Etsy and Ben and Jerry's is a public company. So could you talk more about that? I think ultimately. Um, when you have a Rana Plaza situation on your hands, you know, 1,100 people killed when the building collapsed, or Tazreen fashion that caught fire and you had, uh, if I'm not mistaken, hundreds of people, you know, killed there and people harmed by supply chain decisions, who ultimately is responsible? Is it, um, you know, is it the factory? You know, is it the manufacturer? Is it the agent in those, those examples? Um, it, ultimately, in our, in our mindset, it's us. You know, we're, we're sourcing, we're, you know, traveling around the world looking at these suppliers, and if we're not, we're not doing our job. Um, from an economic theory standpoint, I, you know, I don't know. But we feel it's, it's ultimately our responsibility. And so when, when PETA, you know, sticks their finger in our chest and says, you know, you're, you're force-feeding, and live plucking geese and ducks, and, and we're not down with that. Um, when they send people into the wool supply chain with cameras and they find things that horrify us, we take that really seriously. We feel responsible for that. So, you know, that's our posture. Questions? Oh, you mentioned about the you, you mentioned about the long-term relations you have with your suppliers. Does that trickle down to the second tier, that is the farms? Or mm. is that something that the suppliers would do and you don't really go to that level? And if you could speak to that. It, it definitely trickles down to tier two, the raw material suppliers. Um, we've consolidated that supply chain to the extent we can, and those are long-term you know, relationships. When you get down to the farm level, it's, it's really hard to know that. We talked a little earlier about the organic cotton uh, supply chain in India. Um, you know, I had a chance to visit firsthand, and it's a very, very loose network of family-owned farms. I mean, it's, it's really difficult to pinpoint and nominate and specify which, you know, these farms that, you know, you're, you're going to use. Um, but as we rebuild the merino wool um, supply chain from the, you know, PETA incident that we suffered through recently, we're a lot smarter. You know, we're looking at the farm and the ranch level on how they manage and treat lambs and sheep, you know, in their care. And so in that case, uh, we want to. I think it depends, you know. In the case of wool, um, I think it's absolutely possible. We know single source parts of the wool supply chain yield the best quality product, the best hand feel, the best um, textile. 
Uh, so it's not advantageous to have eight different ranches providing wool because it hammers the, you know, the hand field of product. So, you know, the, sh the short answer is we want to do that. The, the re reality of it all is that some of those supply chains are so broad you can't possibly do it. Um, I was just going to ask, <clears throat> you said in your presentation that you look for innovations to scale across the industry. Uh, what interventions or approaches have you found to be most successful in tipping those scales? Um, we have found that when we uh, have an innovation, and the best example is in our surf um, category, uh, wetsuits. You know, when we first started making wetsuits in, in 2005, uh, we were just using conventional neoprene, then we used a limestone-based neoprene, and then we, we found this um, supplier who was able to turn guayule plants into a, natural, a naturally based neoprene. And, you know, it's just fantastic. The, the wetsuit has more stretch than anything that we had tested at that time. It, environmentally, it was a no-brainer. And functionally, it was one of the best uh, materials we had ever used for the wetsuit. So we could have easily said, okay, surf industry, Ulex wetsuits, only Patagonia has them. Um, you know, we have the you know, monopoly or the exclusive rights to this material. O'Neill, Hurley, Rip Curl, uh, you guys are on your own. But we didn't. We invited them, you know, to the booth at OR. We said, guys, we want you to use Ulex. You know, one, it reduces the cost because it scales out. They can produce more, and, you know, in true ec economic theory and lowers the price. Um, but two, it gets an entire industry, if we're successful, off a a petroleum-based product and, and an extractive, you know, foundational product. And that is a huge win. So our position on innovation like that, water-free dyeing, if we're successful, um, we will grant that to the entire industry. We might hang on to it for a season or two to build awareness to it, but after that time, we're going to open it up and have everyone jump on it as a way to use the, the company to inspire solutions to the environmental crisis. Okay, we'll take one question here. Yeah. Hi there. My question is on the consumer perspective of the social impact piece. You know, I, for one, as a student, I'm sure everyone here in this room really studying it as a business model are extremely blown away with the social impact element. But how does your everyday consumer, maybe not as educated, have you done research into how they value all of your social impact um, messages, everything that you really do so well? You know, how do they value that versus the other things that might be part of their purchase decision? Well, that one's a real, a real tough one because, you know, the product is really expensive. I mean, there's, it's no secret that uh, the Patagonia product is, is non inexpensive. It's hard to come by. Um, uh, what we try to do is talk about the durability of it, talk about the timelessness of the design, talk about the fact that it was made as responsibly as, as we can. You know, a lot of, uh, we call them, uh, you know, dirtbag climbers. You know, Yvonne in the early days is what he calls a—he calls himself a dirtbag climber. They're, um, well, some of them are eating cat food out of cans, and they don't have you know six hundred ninety-nine dollars to get a you know a Gore-Tex shell. We we try to to create a market for used product for people who are just coming into the company to buy used product online. We through our our twenty million in change fund Yertle, we're trying to you know, grow this market for used clothing. Um, but I think your question touches on a, a real sore spot, and that is, you know, it costs a lot of money to build this product, and the retail and wholesale prices reflect that. Question there? Yeah. Uh, you have to switch it on. Uh, I just wondered a little bit about... Um, so it sounds like a lot of production happens overseas. Uh, I'm wondering if um, if there is much production happening domestically, um, and if there is, I guess, any of your thoughts on that. Well, um, you know, we're very conflicted by that. Um, in in 1994, the company had 30 percent of its production in the United States, and a good 60 percent of its production manufactured in the Western Hemisphere using inputs from the United States. So in other words, raw material from United Knitting, from 
uh, Darsberg at that point from Polar Tech, and either made in, in factories in Seattle, Utah, Tennessee, Pennsylvania. We had a really neat network back then of U.S. Um, sewing factories. Um, and another neat network in, in Mexico and Central America. Um, back then, there were 2.2 million jobs in, in apparel and textiles in the United States. You know, now today, um, it's 400,000 and the number is decreasing. Um, and so with that, you know, the number of good factories to manufacture in has really, you know, come down. Um, we were very vocally against and we were at odds with our trade organization, the Outdoor Industry Association, because of our stance on the, tra the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So, you know, as one expert explained to us, you know, that, that starts, you know, the three most important co countries in the TPP are Vietnam, Vietnam, and Vietnam. So, right? <laughs> low-cost, duty-free imports. And Vietnam is our largest um, country of import now. So now it's completely flipped to Patagonia. 30% is made in the Western Hemisphere, uh, a smattering of US-based product. Um, and 60% is made you know, in, in Asia. So duty-free imports from Vietnam will kill Polar Tech and United Knitting. I don't think there's any secret about that, and I think that um, you know the 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 fellow countries. So Japan will be a big part of of the textile aspect to the TPP. Japanese fabric and Vietnam factories mean duty free imports into the states. I think knit goods, fleece, um, mills that compete with Polar Tech are now going to be at an upper hand. Um, we feel very let down by the TPP, um, but we at the same time aren't going to pioneer and break trail, right, for U.S. manufacturing because we need to be competitive. You know, we were against NAFTA and we we're publicly against NAFTA, we we're publicly against TPP. Its impact on global emissions is, I think, profound. Um, it does nothing to help with the 2030 2 degrees Celsius limit that we have and we're, we're really troubled. So, you know, you know, that's kind of our take. We spent a lot of time in Washington this, this past spring when that, when that TPP was, uh, you know, going in front of the House. And, you know, it's anyone's guess if it passes. I don't, I don't think it's going to pass. Um, and we would cheer that. Well, with that, we are out of time. So uh, let's uh, give uh, Doug a big round of applause. <laughs> I would also particularly like to acknowledge the Net Impact Club, uh, who helped support uh, organize this event, as well as at the university level, uh, the advisory committee to the president of the University on Labor Standards and Human Rights. Uh, we have some members here and co-sponsored this and Ross School of Business. Uh, Doug, I know this is your first visit to Ann Arbor, but hopefully this will uh, be beginning of a good relationship. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you.